we are on. Okay. All right. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon for people in other time zones. Uh, my name is Patrick Williams. I'm going to present today about um, a couple of repositories that we have uh, within OpenBMC, SDBus Plus and Phosphor Dbus interfaces. So in agenda, um, I'm going to introduce myself. I'll talk a little bit about how this fits into the overall OpenBMC architecture. Uh, and then I'll talk about these two different libraries uh, and something in Dbus called service location. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of our the plans that I have for future features. All right, a little bit about me. I'm a software engineer with the Facebook hardware engineering team. Um, I started at Facebook in 2019. Um, prior to that, from 2015 to 2017, roughly, I was working at IBM on the OpenBMC project. So people that have been around that long probably know me from those days. Um, I stepped away for a couple of years to do some other things at another company. And then, like I said, joined Facebook last year. Um, right now within the OpenBMC community, uh, I'm one of the main maintainers on the SDBus Plus repository, the Phosphor DBus interfaces, which are the two that I'm going to talk about today. Um, also the OpenBMC Docs and Meta Facebook, which is where we keep our, our um, Facebook machines that we're developing OpenBMC for. All right, getting into the architecture a little bit. Um, this is fairly high level architecture. I'll, some of these terms I'll, I'll clarify a little bit more, go into more detail about them later on. Um, but a fundamental piece of the OpenBMC architecture is Dbus. Um, so we do all of our inner process communication over Dbus. Um, and if you look at how OpenBMC is organized, it's organized as a bunch of small processes that communicate over Dbus. Um, so usually you have Dbus servers that are focused on some problem domain, um, like examples I listed here, HWMon, which would be your sensors um, from hardware. Uh, inventory might be another segment of processes. Um, so it's things like Entity Manager and Fruit de Device, I think, are two processes that deal with that. Um, state management, um, recording events, so you can create things like cells and event logs and those kinds of things. Um, so you have different processes that are long running servers that serve up some kind of feature like that. Um, and then similarly, you have Dbus clients. Um, a lot of those are the external interfaces that go outside of the BMC, but there are some that are you know, processes within the BMC, for instance, events that happen and there's a, a Dbus client that get, gets launched. Um, but the external interfaces, you can think of like IPMID and Redfish and PLDM. Um, so like IPMID, uh, as an example, um, we have you know, messages coming from a host, for instance, if you're doing IPMI up to a host, um, and they may be doing queries where they're trying to read cells, for instance. And so those IPMI commands that come in um, get handled through the IPMI daemon and a bunch of Dbus operations uh, go to talk to the event management or the cell management processes. Um, similarly, like Redfish, um, uh, just coming up with an example, maybe like code update. Um, so when we do software updates of the BMC, you can push the image over Redfish, um, and Redfish will put the image in a location and trigger some Dbus operations um, to start the code update process. Um, so within Dbus, there's something called interfaces, and you can think of those as classes. Uh, we have those all documented in a repository called Phosphor DUS Interfaces. Uh, and so those are all the different um, feature domains that we have uh, classes implemented and defined for. Um, and one, one piece of the architecture is that there can be multiple implementations of the same interfaces. So for instance, um, I know on one of our systems, um, we have two different processes that handle sensors, at least two different processes. Um, one is the Dbus sensors repository, and the other is, I think, called Foster NVMe. So some of the NVMe hard drives that are in our servers are connected to the BMC, and there's a separate repository that creates the sensors for um, those NVMe, NVMe drives. <clears throat> uh, and then the last part of the our overall architecture is that when you have an interprocess communication of some sorts, you have to have some kind of service location defined. And so Mapper is the piece of software that um, does our service location. And I'll talk about 
all of these pieces, hopefully in more detail. Yeah. All right, so what is DBUS? Um, DBUS is, a, <clears throat> I listed here, a protocol for inter-process communication. It's widely used on Linux, especially desktop Linux. Um, so there's a standard that's been around, I think, for well over 10 years that's maintained by Free Desktop, um, freedesktop.org. And then there's, you know, so a lot of the large Linux projects like Desktop, GNOME, and KDE both implement Dbus protocol or interfaces. Um, Systemd also implements a number of Dbus interfaces. Um, so like a, a practical example of where Dbus is used on the desktop that I saw um, was uh, if you have your phone synchronized with your computer <clears throat> over Bluetooth and a call comes in, <clears throat> a call comes in on your phone, um, there's some Bluetooth messages that get sent to your computer. Uh, and so there's a, there's a um, process that runs on desktop Linux that receives that Bluetooth message and sends a message over Dbus, a signal over Dbus saying there's a, a phone call that was just accepted. Um, and it can automatically mute uh, your music player that was running in the background, for instance. So it'll pause maybe Spotify or whatever your music player is can be automatically paused while your phone call is going on on your phone. <clears throat> um, and so that, that whole process, um, there's some interfaces that have been defined by the Bluetooth daemon uh, to express that signal and the events around phone calls coming into your computer. Um, so within <clears throat> with OpenBMC, we do similar things where we define um, we define you know, a model of some usually a lot of times a piece of hardware, um, some behavior around a piece of hardware, um, and we expose properties, methods, and signals around that piece of hardware. Um, so concepts that Dbus has. Uh, there's something called a service. A service is a daemon that's attached to the bus. Um, so that is you know, a daemon that can send and receive messages on the bus. Um, within Dbus, everything is object oriented. So really it's providing objects on the bus. Uh, there's something called an object path. An object path, uh, it, if you can think of ob the objects as being in a file system like hierarchy. Um, so there's a root and then there's you know, levels beneath that. Um, so an object path is, it's actually defined with slashes just like a file system path. Um, so objects have some location of where they're at and because it's a hierarchy they can have parents and they can have children just like directories uh, in your file system would have. And then at those object paths are a set of interfaces. Um, so you can think of interfaces as being the class around the object. Um, so because there, I, I notice I'm using plural interfaces, um, objects themselves support multiple inheritance. So you can have at any location in the hierarchy, you can have multiple interfaces at that location. Um, a, let's see, an interface has three things with it. There are properties. Uh, which are what store values. Um, so someone can, for instance, if they know about where an object is at, they can read a property value out of your object. Um, and some properties can be written to as well. So there's, a, there's flags in Dbus that specify if a property is readable or writable, um, if it generates a signal automatically when the property changes, um, some things like that. The next thing on an object that you'd be pretty familiar with with object-oriented programming is methods. So interfaces can define methods um, that take any number of parameters and do something and then potentially give a return back or an error back. Um, so Dbus also has those defined. And then the last thing is that they have signals. So an object can send out a signal, uh, it broadcasts it, and other processes, any clients that are on the Dbus can listen to that signal and you know, make reaction to it. Um, so at the very beginning, I mentioned like Bluetooth, that would be likely a signal um, that would say that um, a, a call has, has started and then maybe a signal when the call has ended. Um, similarly on desktop Linux, like the, the screensaver, there's signals for the screensaver when the screensaver starts or the lock screen starts. And then when, it, when a user unlocks, there's another signal about that. 
Um, so within Dbus itself, there are some interfaces that are defined by the standard or by the protocol. Um, I just gave two examples here. Um, object manager and properties are two example interfaces. Um, and then there's with those, there's methods and properties within those interfaces and signals. So for instance, like the, the org free desktop Dbus properties property changed signal is a signal that gets emitted on the Dbus whenever uh, whenever a property changes. Okay, any uh, questions so far on where we're at here? Okay. All right, going into the Dbus details a little bit, uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, I've ran a program that you have on Linux. You also have it on the OpenBMC. Uh, it's provided by System D. It's called Bus Control. So Bus Control gives you a way to monitor and interrogate the Dbus. Um, there's, I gave two examples of commands here. There's a, a number of other ones, uh, but these two commands are great for looking at a Dbus, uh, looking at the Dbus and seeing what objects exist here. Uh, so I just, took, uh, I just took a random service that was running on my desktop, uh, org free desktop timesync one, uh, so I can run bus control tree, and you can see the, the hierarchy that I talked about um, the, of the object paths that that service is providing. So the, the leaf node that the service is providing is similarly called org slash free desktop slash time sync one. The next call that I made here was something called introspect. Uh, and so what you can do there is you can provide, the first parameter is a service, which is the same service I provided the, the first call. And the second is an object path. And it will, what it will do is to tell you all of the interfaces that exist at that, um, at that object path. Um, so in this case, there's three that you see here that are standard Dbus ones, org free desktop Dbus, introspectable, peer, and properties. Uh, and so those have, a couple methods and you notice that under properties there's also that properties change signal that I talked about. And then the the interface that is unique to this particular service is called timesync1.manager. Uh, and so you see here that it has a number of properties that are exposed. Uh, in this particular case this service is related to NTP um, so you can see some of the time servers that I've set up on my computer to have my NTP sync run. So let's see. Uh, so again, talking about those concepts about Dbus. Um, so services, there's a, a there's two different kinds of names that you'll see within services. There are assigned names and claimed names, is what I've labeled them here. Um, so every time you create a Dbus server, uh, the Dbus daemon or Dbus broker will automatically assign you a service name. Uh, and those service names are usually these colon one dot, like in this case, 103. So that you can consider them effectively a random number of sort uh, that the Dbus broker automatically assigns you. The thing that's more useful to do though is to get a claimed name. Um, and so for instance, like this time sync one, the daemon that is exposing this service claims that name. <clears throat> so that no other process can expose that name, first of all, and second of all, because it gives a well-formed location that other, you know, other programs know to look for um, this service at that name. So if, if for some reason I had some program that really wanted to know what the NTP server was, um, you could potentially hard code the service name into your code um, to go find the timesync one service. Uh, I mentioned that objects live at some path. So example here is that org free desktop time sync one uh, and objects can have any number of interfaces, right? So like in this case, uh, there's the four here, they're exposed on this object. Um, and then the interface, uh, interface members all have types. So I didn't talk about that on the, I'm going to the right hand side again. Uh, it's a fairly elaborate type system. So if you were to go down to, for instance, like NTP message um, is about, uh, three quarters of the way down the screen. Um, you'll see that's a property and the type of it, the signature is listed as parentheses, U, 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 I, T, T, A, Y, et cetera. Um, and I don't remember what all those types mean, but in this case, it's saying that it's a structure. That's what the parentheses mean. Uh, I believe it's a structure and the U's are 
probably unsigned integers, it looks like. So there's four unsigned integers followed by a signed integer, uh, et cetera. And again, I don't remember all the different types. I know S's are um, strings. Um, I think like U, I, A, and X are all different sizes of integers. Um, and then if you look at property changed a couple lines up, you'll see that that's a signal. And the signal has, when, it, when the signal's emitted, the values that come out of it are a string and an array of string and variance, I think is what V stands for, which means it could be anything. Um, and then an array of strings. So that's yeah. when you get a signal, you get all of that stuff back. Um, so so Patrick, matter, quickly, so yeah. A stands for array of uh, following type. I believe so, yes. Yes. So uh, when you say A is means the following types are array of those types. Correct. Yep. And I'm doing the I'm doing it from memory, so I don't recall exactly what those types are, but yeah. just looking at what, what it is, I'm pretty sure that A is array, and then whatever immediately comes after it is what the array is. And so in this case, the per, the curly braces signify an array of multiple things. Think of it as another form of struct. Right. Any other questions on this? So like in case of link NTP servers, you have AS means array of strings. It can be a multiple strings of maintaining the servers. Yes. Yep. Um, I think that similarly, if you see the at the very bottom, the last two, there's a server name, which is a single string. Um, and then the last one is system NTP servers, which is an array. And so probably the server name is maybe the one that it selected and the, the one at the bottom are all the various NTP servers that it could choose, right? Usually you have multiple of them. Um, and in fact, the very first property under TimeSync1 is fallback NTP servers. And so you see there, it says that I've got four, it's an array of strings and there are four in that array is what that first value is. So there's four fallback NTP servers that my computer has configured. So what were signals again? Like how were the different from methods? Yeah, good question. So um, proper, so I'll, I'll go through all three of those again. Um, properties are something that are, say, are held by the Dbus server, right? So that's the long running process. Um, you know, think of it almost like a file, but it only li lives for the length of the process. Um, methods are something that are, again, are held by the server but are called by a client. So a client can call into a Dbus daemon and say, do something for me. Um, so in this particular example, uh, under properties, there's a get method and a set method. So it happens that when you look at a Dbus property, under the covers, what it's actually doing is calling this properties.get or properties.set methods to implement the property behaviors. Um, so if you were a, if you, if I wanted, for instance, to call this Dbus daemon and set the server name property, the way that I would do that would be to make a method call to this server on the properties interface, the set method, and I would you know, pass appropriate set of parameters to tell it the server name property is what I want to update, and here's what the new value is. Um, signals are emitted by a server. So the server creates a signal in response to something that it's detected within itself. Um, and clients can optionally subscribe to those signals. So you can have a, a uh, you can have a long running process that doesn't provide any Dbus objects, but what it does is listens to services, or to, sorry, to signals that are emitted by another service. Um, so a, a very common one is the property changed signal. Um, so like one thing you could do is our sensors, they have, a, um, they have an interface called sensor.value sensor .value or a property called sensor.value, I forget which one it is. Um, but uh, every time like uh, the Dbus sensors daemon does, updates its polling loop and updates the sensor and a, a property change signal gets emitted with the new value that that property now holds. Um, so if all you wanted to do was, for instance, like 
record um, 10 seconds worth of some sensor value, you could do that by simply starting up on the DBus and subscribing to the properties changed signal that's coming from the sensor you wanted and just listen to that value being updated for 10 seconds. Got it, cool. Thanks. Answer your question? Okay. Yep, yeah, thank you. Yep. All right, so that's, <clears throat> that's the introduction here to DBus. Now I'm gonna talk about the libraries that we have in place for DBus. <clears throat> the first one uh, that I think almost all code on um, OpenBMC uses for DBus interaction is something called SDBus Plus. Um, what it is, is it's our C++ library for doing DBus operations. <clears throat> so the way it got its name is that there is a library that Systemd provides that's called SDBus. Um, SDBus is an implementation of the DBus protocol that again is part of the Systemd uh, repository and provided by Systemd, uh, but it's a C API. Um, so, you know, it, it, it has advantage and disadvantage of being C. Um, and so because we were writing uh, a lot of the early code in C++, uh, we wanted to write a wrapper around that that had more C++-like calling conventions. Um, and so we created this SDBus Plus. It's a lightweight wrapper around the SDBus calls. Um, so in most cases, it's all header files and it just turns into inline calls to the underlying C code um, from SDBus. Um, but it has advantages of being modern and implemented with modern C++. Uh, it has RAII, resource acquisition as initialization. Um, so you do things like if you're doing C, you'd have to make a call to go create a bus. And then when you're done with the bus, you'd have to free, make another call to free the bus. Similar with messages, you have to go ask to create, create a message and then at some point call you know, the equivalent of um, malloc and free, like those pairs. Um, but by us doing it as a C++ library and creating classes around it, um, we can create really lightweight wrappers so that objects automatically are destructed when they go out of scope and we don't have any memory leaks or anything like that. Um, another big advantage of it is the type deduction. Um, so if you recall on the previous slide, all of those properties and methods and everything, they, have, they can have a fairly complex type signature. Um, and one of the features of SDBus Plus is that when you make function calls, um, it can detect by the C++ type what it thinks the underlying DBus type should be and automatically do conversions back and forth. Um, so that, yeah, that's what it, one of the things that it does. Um, and the other thing that it can do or that it does is turn errors into exceptions. Um, so at one point we had a philosophy of using exceptions for everything because it tends to clean up the error paths quite a bit. Um, there's a lot of, of errors that you, you can just percolate up um, because you don't really have any good way of handling it anyhow. So a lot of the really low level DBus errors, you maybe don't have any way to handle um, and those can turn into exceptions and the ones that are interesting you can catch. Uh, so I'll, I'll pause there and look over at the right hand side of the screen. Uh, to, this is a example, and this is in the SDBus Plus repository under the examples directory. Um, this one I think is called, I think it's called like listusers.c++, again, going from memory. Uh, but this is a DBus client. And so what this is doing <clears throat> is, again, the system D has a, a DBus daemon that's um, serving a service called login1 and at a particular location, again, org free desktop login one is the path, the object path, the one dot manager. And that, ma that manager interface. And so what we're going to do with this example is that it calls the list users method on that interface in that, at that object path in that service. So, you know, looking at main, um, you know, third line down <clears throat> is calling an SDBus plus function to go create a bus connection. Um, so in this case, it says new default system. Um, so that's creating a, a connection to the default bus. Um, I'll, I'll take a segue there for a second. In DBus, there are two kinds of buses. There is the system bus and there is the user bus. 
Um, in OpenBMC, we only use the system bus. Um, the user bus is, is more widely used on desktop environments where you could potentially have multiple users that are logged in and you want to be able to segment um, processes between users. So when you log in to a, a Linux machine, there is a new user bus for each user. Um, okay, so continuing on. So we're creating a connection to the, to the system bus, um, formulating a method call object. So that's the next line, auto m equals and new method call. So that's requesting a method object from the bus. Uh, and then the next line is calling that method. So in this case, the method doesn't seem to have any parameters. Uh, it's just, a, you know, it takes no parameters and it's just gonna give us stuff back. Um, so we're catching that reply. Um, the next line you'll see, you know, a C++ type that's fairly complex. We've got a vector of a tuple and that tuple is going to store an integer, an unsigned integer, a string and an object path. Um, and so that's obviously the signature of this list users function. The return value of it is this vector or in Dbus terms, an array. Um, and then, so we, we, get, we got the reply back from our method call and we'll just call a read function on that reply to get out all the stuff that the list users function gave us. Um, and so these two lines here are kind of the magic of the type deduction that I was talking about. You can de define your C++ type that matches what you think the method call is going to have. And then um, at compile time, uh, SDBus Plus does all the right de underlying Dbus magic to um, pull the data out of the right type. Um, and then the last thing is it's just going iterate, to iterate through that vector that it got and print out one of the strings in it, which is probably the username. Um, so SDBus Plus supports most of the um, C++ STL containers that you'd be familiar with. Um, I know vector supported. I think list is both kinds of maps, both map and unordered map. Um, I think sets were added recently. So all those kinds of things are supported within SD bus plus. <clears throat> okay. Going back over to the left hand side again. Uh, most of the functions have a name that corresponds to their underlying SD bus counterpart. Um, so that's useful if you wanted to know, you know, maybe we didn't document well what a particular function does and you wanna look it up in the man page. Um, so a lot of these SDBus functions are pretty well documented in man pages. <clears throat> so there's this kind of one-to-one -one mapping between them. Um, I gave an example here of bus get unique name or SDBus get unique name is the same as our bus classes member function get unique name. Um, and then the last tidbit here is that there's also, and I haven't, I don't, I don't cover it in the slide or in this in this presentation, but you can also do um, boost ASIO. So if you want to do async asynchronous operations, either client or server, you can set that up um, by using the boost ASIO library. Any hey, Patrick. On? Yeah. Uh, in OpenBMC, why don't we use user bus uh, thinking for like user management? So right now, everything runs as root. So there is no multiple users to use the user bus. Um, and even if we had multiple users, I think in most cases, the users would themselves be interacting with things that are really at a system level, right? There's, there's not really much at, a, at, at the hardware level that we currently have that would be user specific. Um, it's, uh, I don't think, yeah, the, this, so there's two kinds of permission segmentation that you can do within Dbus. Um, one is the user versus system. So you can create users that can't even access the system bus if you really wanted to hard limit things. Um, you can also create policies. Uh, so we could, let's say we do have multiple users um, that, let's say you want to create multiple users that can maybe SSH in and do things, um, but you wanted to be able to limit what kind of Dbus operations they can do. You, there are something called Dbus policies that you can put in place that Dbus will enforce and prevent a particular user or a particular group from doing certain Dbus operations. Um, so like it, it, a big part of it is just we, we don't have that side of the security pieces of it really worked out. And I don't, I don't know that the user bus is really a, applies well to what we're currently doing on the BMC. 
I think the policies would probably be a better approach, at least in the short term, if we started having a lot of multiple users where you want to segment what those users can do. Makes sense. Thank you. Okay. A quick, quick question on the same follow up is, are you saying that all, because OpenBMC, we are using system bus all every applications almost. So those applications cannot be run by a non root user. Um, I don't think that that is true. I think that you'd have, I, I don't recall the default policy in Dbus for the system bus. Um, I don't remember if it's default is to block everything or to allow everything, uh, but you could certainly create po policies uh, that, and this would be good for us to do, if we, for instance, wanted to start running a daemon as a non-root user, we'd want to create a policy, a dbus policy that goes along with it that says, what can that daemon do? Um, and so that would do things like, you maybe all the, diva, the daemon does is it exposes objects Right, so you could say, okay, this this daemon can create objects, and I think you can even say it can it can create objects. So these types or these paths. Um, similarly, for a Dbus client, um, you could limit what kind of operations they could do. Um, so, like thinking hypothetically, uh, with something like Redfish or our web, web API. If you wanted to create multiple user classes where you've got maybe an admin class and then a lower level class of user, a group, if you will, um, you could actually create dbus policies where that, that, that lower permission group can, has a limited subset of what dbus operations they can perform. And then when the web request comes in, you could, d, you could, d, um, <laughs> you could switch the user of that handling thread to be the user that was logged in. Um, and then Dbus would automatically enforce those policies. Um, so that would give us kind of a second level of protection where maybe we've got code in, in the web server that ideally prevents certain users from doing certain operations um, because of their class. But then you also have at the Dbus level, you're also shielding so that those users can't do things. Um, does, that, does that give you an idea, VJ? Okay, not hearing anything, so I'm assuming yes. All right, I'm gonna continue on. Um, all right, so another piece of the SDBus Plus repository is a, a tool called SDBus Plus uh, Plus. Uh, so introduction to what that does. Uh, if you, if I mentioned that SDBus Plus the library can do automatic type deduction for method calls and properties. But when you do something wrong, it raises an exception. Uh, so you can kind of think of, okay, is there a way we can detect that at compile time for known interfaces um, that we, we know exist? Uh, can we do something to automatically detect at compile time that the method call parameters are wrong or the return values are not right in the, in the C++ code? Um, also, if you just look at the code for creating a Dbus object or for interacting with a Dbus object, there's quite a bit of boilerplate to do that. Um, so SDBus++ plus plus is a, a Python tool that creates from a YAML definition of an interface. It can create C++ header files and class files um, that implement um, that interface um, to aid in um, to aid in the implementation. So what ends up happening is you can define an interface with a YAML file. You can run this SDBus++ tool and it creates you a class definition. Um, and then what you can do is you can just override that class, some of the methods in it to implement your method calls and your properties on um, the object. Um, I'll have an example on the next slide of, of what that really means. Um, but what it currently does, the tool, um, is it creates what I call normal synchronous server bindings. Uh, you'll see that there are a lot of repositories that use those server bindings to create their objects. It doesn't currently support ASIO and it doesn't currently support client bindings. Um, so those are both features that are uh, hopefully upcoming. <clears throat> 
All right, so some examples. Um, if this is hard to read, apologies. Uh, it's in the SDBus Plus repository. There's an example subdirectory, and you'll see there's a calculator server.cplus. Um, alternatively, these slides are on the wiki already, so you can go find them there if you wanted to look at them. Uh, there's three parts here. So on the left, starting with the left, I've got um, the YAML file format for a, a hypothetical interface. Um, I'll talk through that. So this is an interface that I'm calling calculator. Um, and calculator defines two methods. Um, it can multiply and it can divide. Uh, and so the multiply has a parameter X and a parameter Y. Those are the integers you want to multiply. And it returns you an integer Z. Uh, so you can see that near the top here of the method calls. Uh, and it, it provides a couple other things. But I'm just going to start with that for the example. So if you run SDBus++ on this YAML file, it will create a, a header file and a, a C class that can be compiled into a library. And then if you want to use it, you use the code in the middle. Um, so this is, um, let's see, the first line here is just a, a type definition. So what you can see here is that there's a type called object T, which is part of the systemd or SDBus++ library. Um, and then you have to tell it what type that is. And so it's this calculator type, um, net pottering server calculator. And so what, we've, what I've done here is create a new class that inherits from that generated class, um, has a trivial constructor, and then the multiply function, um, what you see that that does is it, it effectively returns x times y. Right, very, very trivial. Uh, forget about this last result for a minute. That's updating some properties that I didn't show in this example. Um, so here what we've done is we've said, okay, there's a method that we defined called multiply. We've documented what it is, what parameters it takes, and then we've implemented an implementation of it. Uh, and it's, it's trivial. It takes two parameters, x and y, and multiplies them and returns the, the value. And then in the third panel here, um, is the server implementation that uses this class. Um, so there's a, a couple lines here that are you know, trivial, um, defining paths and things like that. But you see auto B, we again create our bus. Um, we create something called an object manager on the bus. Um, we request a service name. So now we've, at that point, we've got a daemon that is running. It's requested a name called net.pottering.calculator as its service name. The next line uh, instantiates the calculator class, and it passes in some parameters to say, where does that class belong? What bus does it belong on? And what object path? Um, but other than that, there's no code for that calculator object, because we've already implemented that in the center panel. Uh, and then the dbus daemon just does a while forever loop that's just processing dbus messages. Uh, it handles client requests and then waits for the next one. Um, so with, with this code, like I mentioned, there was the generated SDBus++ generated um, class that handled um, all the registering all the callbacks with the underlying SDBus library to handle you know, the multiply method call and the divide method call and property um, reads and writes and those kinds of things. Uh, and those callbacks end up calling virtual functions like this multiply function. Um, so that when a client makes a dbus operate or a dbus request and say call multiply on calculator um, it redirects into this virtual function that you've implemented multiply and does what you've asked it to do right. any questions on this uh i have a question sure uh Dbus has a uh, kind of well-defined uh, XML-based uh, description. Why was the reason to bring a new YAML description? Good question, and I don't remember the history, to be honest. Um, it was, I think, four or five years ago that we made some of the decisions. Um, so I, I don't have a good answer for you. OK. But that's so strange. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I, if you want to connect with me offline, I can try and look into, I, I actually don't recall a whole lot about the XML format. Um, 
yeah, I don't recall a whole lot about that. So I can, I can look into it and see if I can try and remember any of the history there for you. Sorry. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Um, I, you know, I, I think if we wanted, we could certainly, I, I, it wouldn't be very difficult, I think, to enhance the SD++ to handle some XML format if that was what was desired. <clears throat> um, I do know that uh, in, typically the YAML is easier for humans to read and write, right? Which is the primary consumer of the interface definitions. Um, and so, you know, being something that humans interact with uh, you know, in Python, it's trivial to just do yaml.load or xml.load or whatever your, your underlying library is, right? So um, if we wanted, we could certainly change the format pretty, pretty easily. Okay. All right, like I said, this example is in, in the code repository already, uh, if you want to play with it and explore it in more detail. All right, so the next, the next library that we have, a repository that we have is called Phosphor Dbus Interfaces. Uh, so what is that? Uh, it is the repository of all the common OpenBMC interfaces. Uh, so those are documented in that YAML format that I showed on the last screen. So if you look at it, it's a repository of mostly just a whole bunch of YAML files. Uh, and the purpose of it is that any, any two repositories that want to talk to each other in some way um, should have their interfaces documented in Phosphor Dbus interfaces. Um, that way that other repositories can come along and re-implement um, some of those different um, interfaces for a different purpose, right? Like we talked about sensors, there's multiple implementations of sensors that are kind of specialized in certain areas. Um, similarly, we have that for like code update is another area where, you know, there's, there's one piece of code that handles BMC code update, which is very different than like BIOS code update, which is very different than maybe voltage regular code update, which I think there was a question on the mailing list recently about implementing that. So the code update interfaces are defined in Phosphor Dbus interfaces. We have multiple implementations of them for different problem domains. Um, but then external interfaces can hopefully interact with them in a common way, no matter what the implementation is. <clears throat> so some of the, just some of the philosophies that go into that repository, um, what we're doing there is you know, modeling various OpenBMC concepts, um, and we're trying to do it in a software oriented way. And the purpose there is to make the implementations easy um, and to make it extensible for the future. So we usually aren't trying to be matching a particular external interface exactly. Um, sometimes those external interfaces align really well with what we're trying to do and sometimes they don't. So like, you know, just because Redfish did something a certain way doesn't mean that ends up being the way we implement it. Um, because in some cases, like a good, uh, a good software breakdown of some of those Redfish tasks are actually end up being spread across multiple processes. Um, and so we don't always have this one-to-one -one mapping between, for instance, like Redfish schemas um, and our Dbus interfaces. <clears throat> when we're defining them, you know, we also want to consider future hardware designs. Um, so that's something I've been doing a lot lately in some of the code reviews of those new interfaces is making sure that we're considering things beyond the typical single server chassis that has a single host in it. Um, there's a number of systems that different community members are working on that aren't that. And so, you know, when we implement those interfaces, we have to think about um, how would you model this particular system using whatever your interface proposal is? Or, you know, maybe it's not a system, but it's like you're talking about power supplies or you're talking about sensors or hard drives, you know, what, what's something, you know, a little bit more general then the particular problem you're trying to solve, does your proposal map to that more general problem as well? Um, so some example servers that various community members are working on, um, there's uh, you know, a single chassis that has in it multiple hosts. Um, so those are, you know, think of it like a classical blade server design. Those hosts can be potentially removed and added dynamically. They can be powered on individually. Um, and so 
you know, some of our existing implementations don't handle that kind of system design very well. Um, similarly, you could have a system design where you've got multiple chassis, maybe even with their own BMC in each chassis, that are somehow cabled up together to make a bigger computer. Um, and then we have, we have devices that don't have a host processor. Um, so in some cases, people are using OpenBMC to manage devices that aren't a, maybe what a traditional BMC would do, um, but are like network switches or storage arrays, or I think GPU arrays, maybe there's one of those that someone was working on. Um, so you know, atypical devices that aren't strictly a compute or storage node um, being managed by OpenBMC. Keep going. So I've you know, talked a lot about objects and services and those kind of things, <clears throat> but with any inter-process communication, you have to know where are those, right? So I said, okay, so there's a bunch of objects, now what? Um, so yeah, SDBus Plus facilitates defining interfaces, uh, but there's other pieces of DBus like the service names and objects paths. Um, Service names, in some cases, we've decided to fix them as static service names. Um, and, a, and a lot of the desktop world, that's what they do. Like those examples that I gave of like login, login one and time, time sync one, those are static names that they've agreed on. Um, but as we start to expand to some of those other system types, that doesn't necessarily become ideal. Um, like I, managed, I mentioned um, having a blade like server uh, if we have a single service name that handles the host power state, um, that doesn't apply well when we start adding a blade that maybe has eight individual servers in it. And maybe you have eight individual processes that are managing the state for each server independently. Um, in some cases within the DBus YAML, uh, we have given recommended object paths, but currently there's nothing to enforce that. Nothing with SDBus++ plus plus generates anything from those comments. Um, they're just there to kind of aid in the developer. Uh, certainly that's something that could be enhanced if someone wanted to take that on, would be to figure out what's the best way to document some of those object paths and service names. Uh, but even if you have an object path, you still need to know what service provides it. So Mapper is a program that we implemented that helps facilitate that. Uh, what you can do with Mapper is you can do things like say, I know there is a, a bunch of sensors or sensor.value objects interfaces. Mapper, tell me where they're all at. Um, and so there's some function calls that you can make to Mapper that will interrogate the DBus and tell you those things. Um, it actually doesn't interrogate the DBus. What it does is it listens to some specific DBus messages or signals and it keeps all this data almost like in a internal database. Um, so as objects are being created and destroyed, um, Mapper is tracking all of them and can answer these queries relatively quickly. Um, so object mapper is, typic is, is used quite a bit for finding objects of some particular type that you know should exist, but you don't know where they exist. <laughs> um, so that's what Mapper does. Um, like I said, this this whole service location is something that's it's it's not strictly defined, uh, and we could definitely have some improvement to it. Um, but if you see things like Mapper Call, know that that's what it's doing is it's doing object lookups for things that are dynamically named objects and paths and services. All right, uh, what's ahead? So what features I plan on working on? Uh, first of all, Phosphor DBus interfaces is switching to Mason. There's a bunch of repositories that were kind of going through this transition from auto tools to Mason um, for various reasons. The code for this transition for Phosphor DBus interfaces has been in Garrett for about a month and a half. Uh, I'll be merging that pretty soon now. I think we've got good consensus around it. Uh, and I'll also send something out to the mailing list when that happens. Um, there will be a minor process change to how you have to add new interfaces to that repository. It used to be you could just write a new YAML file and we had some scripts that would magically build it for you. Um, Mason isn't quite as flexible in some of those features around dynamically generating code. Um, so we have to, we, we have to um, manually add the new interfaces to some of the Mason scripts. Uh, so like I said, that's coming soon. I'll send something to the mailing list when that happens. Uh, the next big feature that I want to work on is uh, 
C++ 20 coroutines. So the, the latest standard of C++ added something called coroutines, which are similar to what we get with Boost ASIO, um, but it's part of the standard. Uh, so you don't need any additional libraries. And it also has a, a lot nicer syntax. If you were to look at some of the Boost ASIO code, um, what you end up doing is at any of the um, suspend points where you have your asynchronous function, uh, you have to create a lambda that gets call that gets registered as the callback for the next section of the suspend point. Um, with coroutines, it's been added to the language where the there's these um, co-await and co-yield co and co-return. I think are the three keywords uh, where you can define um, the the suspend points, right? So the points where you want to stop your code and wait for an asynchronous event to happen um, and then resume. Um, so that's going to be really handy for um, Dbus client operations where you know, you've got some code running and you want to make a call to some other Dbus, so some Dbus daemon and get some answer from it. Um, but you don't want to block your whole process waiting for that to happen. So you can define a coroutine that says I need to do A, B, and C, and then I need to make a Dbus call, and then I need to do um, X, Y, and Z. And you can do that all in one flat function where the dbus call itself is prefixed with co-await. Um, and then there's a bunch of magic that happens, which when it gets to the co-await, it will start the dbus operation and then register a callback for the whole x, y, and z steps that you had defined. So it's, it's, yeah, a lot, uh, it's, it's a pretty complex feature that's been added to C++, um, but hopefully it'll make a lot of the asynchronous code look a lot cleaner to read as a result of it. Uh, and then the next piece, which is gonna be hopefully built on top of coroutines is the client bindings. Um, client bindings were something that had been intended to be implemented probably four years ago now. Um, but then uh, when I, for instance, left to do other things, no one else picked up to go do it. So it's been unimplemented. Um, but now that the technologies have changed and we're doing a lot of, we're, we're, we've got more interest in doing asynchronous code um, I plan to implement that on top of coroutines so it can be asynchronous. All right, so that concludes what I've got to present today. We've got about five minutes if there's some final questions. Patrick, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, will object mapper uh, acquire only the phosphor Dbus interface uh, interfaces or any new interface also it, it will acquire? For example, if I'm writing a new program and the interface is not defined in the password Dbus interface, will it uh, capture my new interface? It, it will uh, with one caveat. Um, so when we build Mapper, uh, when we compile Mapper, there's a configuration we pass to it, which tells it um, what, um, like you notice all of the, the interfaces are like org.freedesktop or xyz.openbmc project. I think there's some that are like com.ibm and org.openpower. Um, so when we pass, when we compile a mapper, we tell it what of those to watch for. Um, so we don't tell it to watch any of the free desktop ones um, because there's, there's a lot of them and they're not applicable to what we're doing in most cases. Um, but we do have it watch for any that are um, xyz.openbmc project and then on power system, open power systems, the org.openpower and those kinds of things. So uh, if you define new interfaces that are xyz.openbmc project, then yes, Mapper will today automatically catch it. Um, if you're defining or monitor for it and be able to report it. If you're defining ones that are not xyz.openbmc project, but your own domain, for instance, um, you can tell Mapper when we build it to add those into the list that it should watch. Thank you. Yep. Hearing no questions, I think we're done for the day. Thank you, for everybody, for joining and listening. Thanks a lot, Patrick. Had a great session. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Patrick. Welcome.